programs that the Pioneers Museum is so happy to bring to you. Without further ado, I bring you Steamboat's Plains native and NASA astronaut Steve Swanson.
So the whole trip to space takes eight and a half minutes. We go from zero miles an hour to 17,500 miles an hour in eight and a half minutes. Well, after two, a little over two minutes, we get rid of the solid rocket boosters. Now we're just on the three main engines. And those uh, float back down and actually have parachutes that land in the Atlantic and we use them again. It's much smoother once those solid rocket boosters go on and all you're feeling now is acceleration as you go on. It's an amazing ride. And uh, just eight minutes of this, uh, would be like the fastest car you've ever been in just keeps accelerating. It never slows down. So uh, after eight and a half minutes, we get the engine to shut off. I'll say that, you know, kind of watch Sandy here. She's been on station for four and a half months and wants to get back. <laughs> yeah, she was a little happy. So as soon as we get up, though, we have to get the vehicle changed from a, a launch vehicle into a, something that can stay in orbit for a while. So the first thing we'll do, of course, is take pictures. Everybody has to do that. And everybody's, of course, feeling pretty good. We didn't make it. Yeah, but now we have to uh, go ahead and we'll do the first thing we have to do is actually circleize the orbit, which just means we're going to do a, a burn with these smaller engines to help us uh, stay up in space. So you'll see here in a second that uh, we'll get ready for the burn. So we use the orbital maneuvering system engines. And you'll see what kind of acceleration that gives to the people down below. So here's the commander, he's getting ready to type it in. Go through the checklist. And here we'll line them off. So it's not that much acceleration compared to a launch, but still you can tell a lot when you're floating around. And that you can see is looking out the back point of the engines and how it gets the tail red hot. But that's time to uh, get the uh, vehicle ready. So first thing we need to do is open up the tail bay doors. And that provides cooling for all our electronic equipment. And of course, that's where our payload is too. And the next thing we're doing is going to check out the robotic arm. The robotic arm on the shuttle, and we use that along with a boom to take pictures and look at the leading edge of the wing and the nose cap to make sure we didn't have any damage on launch. It takes us about a day to do all that, but that would be way too boring to put into this, so we make it quick. And uh, while uh, people are working the robotic arm, I was down with another guy helping out uh, getting our spacesuits ready for our spacewalks. And then the next day, we get to Montagu in the station. It was a nice sight to see. From here on in, the commander's flying. We'll come up underneath it to about 600 feet. When we get there, if he's going to do a backflip with the vehicle so they can take pictures of our belly. And then once that happens, we'll move on to the front and back on in. So here's a little picture of, the, of us doing our backflip, and you can see what that looks like from the station in the inset. And again, we speed it up because it would take too long to actually show in real time. And what you see right in front of the, shed, the payload bay of the shuttle is our docking port. So that's what we're going to actually dock with when we get to station. <coughs> Just to let you know, the station's about 200 to 40, 40 250 miles up. Uh, it travels around the Earth at 70,500 miles an hour, and that's the 90 minutes for every <coughs> orbit. So you get a sunrise and sunset every 90 minutes. It's actually quite beautiful. That's a well, mission controller watching our every move, making sure we don't make any mistakes and helping out. There's commander flying. Uh, that's his target he's going for. 
So he'll come in, uh, he comes in pretty slowly. It's about uh, a quarter of a foot per second. That's a picture taken from the shuttle, so that's actually the station on the buff side. We're just moving closer to it. He has a tolerance of three inches uh, circular to get that on. He was dead center, that was perfect. Once you attach there, you just pull it in with this, and it will seal the uh, interface. Do some tests to make sure it can hold air. That's a happy flight control team. <laughs> and once it's all good, we can go ahead and open the hatch. That's the way to the station. There's a you know, handshake, of course, uh, what you didn't we missed on the film was Sandy was uh, already aboard our vehicle. We heard, she heard we had chocolate. That's just a Navy tradition, another ship at sea. It's a little different on the sea part. So after a little uh, get together, we get to talk to each other again, say hello go over a safety brief, and then, uh, as uh, the commander here says, we had to go, good work right away. Our job first was to take our payload bay, it's called a big S -S -truss, S -S -S S6 truss segment, uh, which is just a big hunk of metal, out of the payload bay, and get it set up for uh, maneuvering into its location on station, which is actually quite a ways away. And this is a, a big, uh, event for us because it takes two arms as a shuttle arm too and then move it out of the bed and grab it with a shuttle arm and then have the station arm actually move to a different location so they can grab it back and then get it in a position to put it on the end of the truss of the uh, space station. It weighs 35,000 pounds a piece of equipment and we're going to get near the end of it we're getting ready for our first, first spacewalk so I was rigging around with myself so John here is getting in position on the end of the uh, starboard side of the space station. And they're putting us in the uh, hatch. And so we'll get in the hatch, they'll close the, uh, the door for us, so to speak. And uh, we'll, oh, well, then we'll depress, go down to a vacuum, and open the hatch to the outside. And it'll go on out. So when we go on out here, it was nighttime, as you can see. It makes it a little different, of course. We do have little uh, lights on our helmets that help us see. But you uh, don't get this view of the beautiful earth below when you come out that way. It's actually kind of nice because you get yourself, your feet kind of wet, ready to go, and then you see this fantastic view, which can slow you down just a little bit. So that's John driving in, so we're giving him directions, just kind of like backing up the truck, telling him a little left, a little right, keep on coming, okay, you do this, do that. And once he gets it close, we're actually just going to uh, hook it on with bolts. There's four bolts that hold it on. And it's just like being a normal mechanic, when you first use the power drill to get the bolts going and get out a torque wrench and torque it down. So once we got it attached, we had to get it ready to uh, make do its job, which was great uh, electricity. So we had to hook up all electrical cables, get another radiator out there so it can have cooling for the uh, electronics. And then we were ready to come on in. The next day we actually did the unfurling of the solar array. And that was done from inside, computer command. And again, that sped up. It took us about three hours to get those out. So, and that's the due to, they've been inside um, after they're made and storage for eight years. And so we were kind of worried about them sticking together. And you can see sometimes they do separate, they do stick a little bit and separate and it creates waves which can cause damage to them. But we're lucky in that no damage occurred, we got them out fine. And then it was on the rest of the mission for us, which is a two more spacewalks. And those spacewalks were just geared around getting the station ready for other missions to follow us and to help do some maintenance on the space station. And here's what I'm working with a power drill. We got Joe Acabas in my view over there, and the earth below. I tell you, sometimes it was very difficult to keep your mind on your job as you look down at the earth. And here again, uh, Joe's uh, on the robotic arm. He's taking one piece of equipment from the space station to the other side.
So overall, we did three spacewalks, totaled about 22 hours worth of spacewalk time. And again, spacewalk is one of the highlights of a mission. It's a fantastic thing to do. Uh, it's quite thrilling in a way. You're in your own little spacesuit out there. Uh, it is a little difficult though. It's kind of like uh, in here, if you want to go outside and play in the snow, you put on all your winter clothes. We'll go ahead and then do the put on your next to your older brother's winter clothes and then your older brother's winter clothes. And so you have like three layers on and that's what it kind of feels like. So it was time for us to come back. The space watch were done. We were all pretty happy about that. That's a good chunk of the mission. So besides uh, working in space, there's a little about living in space. That's a sleeping bag right there the commander's getting into. You just attach the four corners, tie it up, and then zip it up. You can see he had the, uh, the penthouse suite and the flight deck. We're all down below. Of course, eating in space is a little different. It's a can of peaches he has there. You watch uh, here, especially when he has his oatmeal. They will just kind of flap the shoulder and here they find it the next day. That's a galley. And that's where we rehydrate the food and give it water. There's also a little oven you can put your food in there to heat up. It is clear coated, that red dot, and it signifies it's the commanders. But then again, you can change those out, so it's not a big deal. So we always had a rule that you had to play with your food in space. And one night we uh, ate over in the Russian segment of the space station. A little different, had the Russian food. You hear it's in cans. And it looks like cat food. I'm not going to say it tastes like cat food because I've never tasted cat food. But I think it's pretty close. It actually was quite good. And again, we have to shave and do everything you do in the morning. Brush your teeth, get up, do all the standard stuff in the morning just you do here. It just makes it a little more difficult and a little more interesting. This is our bicycle we work out on. It's actually a little stationary bike, but it broke uh, while we were up there, so we had to fix it. And so they just took it apart. Not too difficult, but it was a, another task. One of our other tasks we had to do was resupply station. So we brought supplies for the space station, and we're taking back some of their stuff that were used up. So this is kind of how you do that. If you want to have a fun, you push it real hard and see if you can knock the guy off. So exercise is part of our daily routine in space. It's Ricky on the shuttle bike. Joe is here on the space station bike. The space station crew members work out two hours every day because they can stay up between four and six months in space and they're definitely worried about muscle loss and bone loss. So working out helps that tremendously. So that right there is the equivalent to lifting weights. It's a great machine. So the space station crew members will do an hour on that and also an hour on our cardio, either the bicycle or the treadmill here. And as a treadmill, you have a harness and budgie cords that hold you down. Or else it wouldn't work so well. And that is one of the first things to do in space is just float around. Or play with your food again. As you notice, it was cut there. It took him about 10 minutes to get all those M&Ms round up. Again, floating is just good stuff. Let's go from the Japanese lab to an American module onto the European lab. No visas required. Now, there are many ways to drink water in space. We usually, usually we use a straw, but John's going to do the old uh, the second down there. This we happen to come on by accident. Just part of the, the bike here is a tension knob and we knocked it out one time and this just floated there forever so we thought we'd take a picture of it. Then we tried to come up with our own version of darts. We had to come do something to create some fun. One of the best things though to do when you're in space is look out the window. So this is looking out the gym or a Japanese module window. It's uh, sped up it's, so it's a 45 minute pass, a daylight pass. You can definitely see how uh, what the earth looks like. Quite amazing, and it's also amazing just to look out at nighttime. Here you can see right there are the southern lights. 
They're fantastic, a nice green view. You can see the lights of the cities. You can also see uh, lightning in the thunderstorms below. It was just wonderful to look out the window. We also got a phone call from a newly elected gentleman. So it was him, a few senators, congressmen, some kids, they talked to us about 25 minutes. Yeah, we appreciate you guys, so uh, look forward to seeing you when you're back on the ground. God bless you. So after that, though, it was time for us to leave the space station. There's Sandy. She's not happy at all coming home. Say goodbye to Koichi. We trained for him with him for a year. And he was standing, he stayed another four months on board. And now it's just the reverse, close the hatches. Get bear back to their spots. Ricky, he made the film here, so he had to have a picture of him putting his flush in here. That button separated the station from the space shuttle. So we back away. We back away at night time. But the idea, when we get about 400 feet away, the sun's going to come up. And that way we can get a really good view of the, of the space station with its new solar array. And also we fly around the space station afterwards to take pictures of it is to uh, make sure there's no other damage that people haven't seen and just to do an overall check of the space station. The space station is actually getting quite big. It's approximately, with the solar rays out there now, about 365 feet wide and about 295 feet long. So from here the sun comes up, and you'll see the shadow actually of the space shuttle on the left side just coming across the station. So this is our fly around. Again, we sped it up. It took 45 minutes to come around. But it was a fantastic sight. You can see the little volumes are in the middle. They say it's about the size of a 777 uh, seven, inside, inside volume. It's quite roomy in there, actually, for six people. It still looks all nice. We've had people living on board the space station since 2000. And then it's time to get ready to come on home. So again, we do the reverse. We close the pillow bay doors. Get back on these orange suits, which are called our pumpkin suits. Okay. And we are happy. We get the Jap ready to come back. He's too happy. <laughs> and those weren't chaps, that's a G suit, just let you know. So now it's time for us to uh, be able to use those. So uh, that means we're going to use those orbital maneuvering system engines again and light them off. We slow down just about 250 feet per second for about 200 miles an hour, and we're going 70,500 miles an hour, and all it does, that's enough to lower us into the atmosphere to use that to slow us down. So here's when we get back, and we're getting some uh, gravity back, that was 0.1 G, or a tenth of a G, and here's a half of a G. So about 35 minutes later, we're coming back into the Kennedy Space Center. It's a nice day, a little windy. The shuttle lands at approximately 230 miles an hour. After the main gear touch, you'll see the pilot will put out the drag chute to help slow us down. So 
So we traveled a little over five million miles, and we landed about six miles from where we took off. So after that, we go ahead and uh, get on out, change our clothes, and walk around the vehicle. It's a tradition to walk around the vehicle and check it over to make sure it's in good shape. So that was our two week trip in about 24 minutes. Steamboat from here to be an astronaut. Well, that's a long story. 
Um, but of course, uh, from here I went to the University of Colorado, got a degree in engineering, and then I went to uh, Florida Atlantic University and got a master's. And we're playing with water again. That's the eyeball in space when you put a uh, piece of lifesaver in there. So after I got my master's, I went to work for a year uh, in, in a field of engineering, but then I also didn't want to go to NASA, not, or I decided I wanted to go work at NASA. So I applied there and uh, started working at NASA. I worked there 11 years, and while I was there, I also got a PhD. And after that, I got selected as an astronaut. Yeah. It's actually, um, I think it's easier to do some things in space when you're floating. Uh, and like moving things around, you don't have to lift things, you just push them along and it goes. But then uh, there are some more difficult tasks and things you just can't set something down and have it stay there, it's going to float away. And so you have to make sure everything's tethered and put away. And you have to be very organized, I guess, in space, uh, which sometimes you don't have to be so much on it. Yes, go ahead. Showers. Showers. That would be a nice thing to have. I know you don't have them, but you have like a sponge bath. You take a washcloth, put some water on it, put some uh, you know, rinse free soap, and uh, wash down. And that's even for six months, that's what they use. And it didn't stink when you got to the station, really. Not bad. Okay, yeah, where in the back? Did somebody halfway kind of transfer for me? Oh, what were that? That's just a clip for you using a book. So you want to hold your page in a book. Like we have all our instructions are in a checklist, and we want to hold on to that page and put the clip on it, and it has Velcro on it, so we can attach it to a wall to keep with us. Yes, go ahead. Did you hear it a little louder, please, sir? Scariest? That is what some of the guys I was were quite scary. <laughs> um, and uh, we don't really worry too much. That's a good question. Uh, you know, our main fear as an astronaut is screwing up. Yeah. So we work really hard and train really hard so we don't screw up. And every other thing we're thinking about, all the other stuff, but that's our main fear actually, is that our mistakes that we don't make, they will have some implication to hurt the mission. And so uh, that's our, actually our scariest thing for us is uh, working hard not to screw up. Yes. Where do we get the food? We bring it with us. Yeah. It's kind of like camping food. Some of it's dehydrated and some of it's in packages you can just open up and eat. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. It's a... Uh, with, with those solar rays on there is a little over a football field, and the length is just about a football field. And, uh, but the inside volume, they say, I've heard many different things, they try to do like a five bedroom house to you know, the size of an air, you know, a large airplane, kind of, that's a little volume you can have inside. How come they have different areas well, um, it's mostly because who built them is what distinguishes. So the Japanese uh, module, which is a lab, and they actually have three separate ones they use, they built those. They all came from the shuttle, those, and then the European module, which is uh, a laboratory, came from the shuttle. Uh, and there's one at the very end of the Russian, uh, which is very similar to the mirror, actually, they had. It's called a service module, and uh, uh, that's, uh, again, where, um, from the beginning, people lived at the beginning, and it was just being built. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, not soon, but I am going to begin. My next uh, mission will be one of those six-month long ones. And so uh, the training for that's about two and a half years long. And so I'll start training in maybe a year or so for that and uh, go up and stay for six months. That, of course, means I'll be going up on a Russian Soyuz rocket, which launches out of uh, um, southern, or it's not Russian anymore, of course, Kazakhstan, Baikonur. And, and uh, this will be a new trip, it'll be interesting and fun. Yes, go ahead. Yep, you. How long have I been an astronaut? I've been an astronaut for about 11 years. Yep. You have one?
Do I know Buzz? <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a good question. <laughs> I think he means Buzz Lightyear. I don't know. I don't know. I've met both of them, actually. Yeah. But, uh, no, um, actually, the one crew took up a Buzz Lightyear with them. And so Buzz Lightyear went to space. And he uh, lived on the space station for a while. Uh, how long do they figure the space station will last? Right now, um, we're trying to get funding to 2020. It could probably last longer. It's just a matter of funding, really, is what's uh, the big issue. Um, and so, it does take a lot of maintenance on it. And right now, we have to do it no or not. The shuttle is only five more shuttle flights that are planned at this time. And our, what we're using those sh uh, shuttle flights for is to resupply or get all the supplies you possibly can get up to the station. And so, it can last for as long as possible. And uh, that's what we're doing right now. And it, it can last easily to 2020. What? What are you hearing? Right. Well, that's a good question. How do you steer? Uh, we use, you can either use a computer or you can manually fly it. And what it has is little jets on the side of it that will make it move how you want to. You can change that to go faster or slower. And uh, so it's a little different flying because uh, we have, when you're flying it manually, you have the ability to change the, we call it the attitude or the rotations, and then also the translations. So we have two controls and we can do both of those at the same time. So. Yes, sir. Actually, no. It's very uh, widely spread across all sorts of fields. I mean, we've uh, even all sciences too, engineering and sciences. It's more of a uh, kind of what you've done in your field, maybe, uh, and also then a lot of other extracurricular things. If you know. Um, from people of, uh, from climbing mountains to doing the you know, marathons to whatever. It's a lot of the things that they want to look at to see if you're more of a, I guess, well-rounded person uh, than not just a specific, you know, a good engineer. They want that too, but they might want to get something else besides that. That will entail traveling a lot. I have to travel to Russia, and Canada, Germany, and to Japan. So about 50% of my time will be away from home for about two and a half years. And I have to learn Russian too, so that's no fun. But knowing the language is a good thing. I don't know, I don't know as you probably can tell, my English is not very good either, so I probably should work on that. Okay, yes, go ahead. What else do we do for fun on Space Station? We saw it quite a bit. It's kind of like uh, one of my things is see if I can do a perfect flip, you know, and not hit any walls, and not move, you know, around. Because when you try to flip yourself, you also will move yourself and then you can go, uh, you know, go across. But you want to stay in a specific spot and not move and just do flips. So I try to do that. See how many flips you can do in a row. Those kind of things. It's just it's fun. Yes? Well, that's a pretty good question. <laughs> yeah, this are supposed to be easy questions, especially when you're three years old. Come on. Uh, well, it's actually, was a, I thought, to get those out and stable is pretty, actually, a great engineering feat. Um, if you notice when they came up, they were packed down tight, and they were done accordion style, but the, the main structure that their stability size that brings them out is in, they call it mass canister, and it's about four feet long. And those things go out about 150 feet. And they have to be very lightweight. And so it was done uh, with this real engineering feat where they use battens, like sailing battens, and as it comes out, they stiffen up and lock into place all by themselves as it goes out. It's just an amazing feat, and that gives you the stability for those solar panels that are way out there. Hey, wait a minute. Blue shirt? How much do I weigh on the rocket? Well, on the rocket, you, uh, when you're in space, you float. Now, you still have the same mass, but you float around. And that's a good question, though. Everybody thinks there's no gravity in space. 
Well, that's just a misnomer that you do have gravity, a misconception, I should say. Um, the idea, though, we are always in a free fall. That's why we have to do it. what an orbit actually is. As you go around the Earth, we are going so fast around the Earth, as we fall, we just never hit the Earth. So we're always falling as we go around. And that gives you the free fall effect, gives you the, act of the idea of floating. So there is a gravity, it's just like we know, and it's not much different than the gravity we have right here. But the fact is, you get where you're going so fast, you never actually hit. And uh, that's actually what it, it defines an orbit. All right? All right, one more. How big is a space shuttle? Yeah, it's about, uh, let's see, 59 feet, I think, in width, approximately. Remember these ones? And it turns like this DC-9, so it's probably about uh, 160 feet long. Like that. It's pretty big. Can I get two questions? Do you have any family members here that you might like to introduce? Not here. They're actually uh, in town. They didn't want to listen to this. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, of course, we don't really see anything out in space too much. Um, it, it already has, like, when you see stars, and if you look at it that way, is that you're in a, in a uh, like, in a house, event with the lights on, and if you look out the window to the dark, you can't see anything, really. So that's kind of what you're really looking at, so you can't see much past at nighttime. And uh, during the daytime, though, you can't, uh, all you really see is uh, the black of space, too, because the sun's so bright. So you really can't see much past that. Of course, looking out the Earth is fantastic, but that's the best thing. And yes, there is a, it does get hit actually by the small, small particles. And anything bigger than that, the actual moon is station. There's a, a place, of course, in Colorado Springs, Nora, that tracks everything bigger than a dime in space around the Earth. And if it's going to come anywhere close to the station, it will move the station so it doesn't get hit. Yes? Those are all good questions. Um, we've got about the retirement the shuttle after five more uh, missions, and then we'll be relying on the Russians. Uh, and what happens with the shuttles afterwards. Uh, so right now, it's actually, that's if you probably just read, they just lowered the price. You can buy one of those shuttles if you want. 29 million, cheap, really. Uh, but actually, we're trying to give, or have museums buy them is what they're trying to do. And, uh, and uh, so they can have it on display. That's the idea. And yes, we'll be relying on the Russians until right now we're trying to build a new rocket. We're designing it at this point, and we're working on getting it together to build it. We actually need uh, a little direction from the White House on which we're going. There's a couple options to go, so we can either make a decision and then we continue building it. So we have to wait for that, but uh, until we get ours done again, we will be relying on the Russians to get us to space. It's not what we really want, it's just the way it worked out. Sorry, a little bit louder. How much well, physical effort is a spacewalk? How much physical effort is a spacewalk? It depends. There's a couple of times where you'll be working really hard on something, just like a stuck bolt, where you have to get in a really good position to get some uh, leverage, and you work really hard. Other times you just float around doing something very easy. But what really gets tired is your fingers and your forearms, because that takes all the brunt of your work is doing that and you have really big gloves on, so when you're trying to work with bolts or anything like that, they, it takes a lot out of your fingers, you really have to push hard on them, so that's really where the uh, fatigue comes in. But overall, it's actually not that bad. The training in the pool, though, is actually quite fatiguing. We train in this large pool, it's so 200 feet by 100 feet, by about 45 feet deep, and we go through all our training in that, and there's still, you have some, all the tools that we, we use there do have the weight, this, uh, weight with them, so it's at least quite heavy, and it takes a lot of effort to do that. What do you think about? What kind of experiments are you guys doing? Oh, that's a good question. What kind of experiments? There's quite a few going on on the space station right now. Um, some of them were here or there, or just after. Um, I don't know if it's a good one or not. They, they brought mice to see how they would actually do with the, that environment and what their bone density loss would be and their muscle loss would be. They actually did that. They do, uh, actually had butterflies 
They go up see how butterflies would react, but they actually had to make cocoons and fly out. Uh, but then they do a bunch of other, of course, uh, scientists were doing crystal growth to um, uh, like a lot of human, actually, the stuff on, uh, we're guinea pigs over up there, so we're doing a lot of stuff on us. And it's just, uh, you go on a NASA type go, actually, there's a whole list of all these things that uh, they're doing right now. All right, let's go back, right there. Nobody's child farther than the moon at this time, you know? And we haven't done that to the moon in a long time, but that's our plan. Our goal is to get back to the moon within this decade, and that would be great. And then after that, when we learn how to actually live there and uh, have a base there, the overall plan is to go on to Mars. But uh, the Mars is actually quite a difficult trip. It's a, it's a three-year round trip to go to Mars, and, and it's uh, too far away, so there's no rescue help or anything possible like that. So that's why we really feel we have to have everything under control and know well before we send somebody on the trip. Yes. Yeah. When we sleep, we bump into things a lot. And you know we don't because our sleeping bags are kind of tied down. So we kind of keep ourselves secure in our sleeping bags. So it's good. we try to make sure we don't bump into things. That's a good point. Of course, unless somebody falls asleep while you're working, which can happen. And you know, if you get tired here and you're doing something and you get the old head nod and you do that and you wake yourself back up, well, you don't wake yourself back up, it's basically because you don't get a head nod. You just kind of go out of sleep. So you have some, you'll come across, if you're working, you'll come across and you see somebody just floating there and you realize they're asleep. <laughs> and there's some evil games you can play that way. That's a good question. I thought we do fly aircraft. We have G38s. It's part of the astronaut program. We do that. It does help us in a lot of training aspects and getting used to flying and working with uh, air traffic control or mission control in each case. Um, and I do like flying. I've always wanted to fly. Uh, also, a private pilot and all that kind of stuff on my own. So it, it does help if you have some operational experience like other airplanes uh, to become selected as an astronaut. Yes. If you stop if you're in space, you just fall, fall straight down. Do, do you have room? That's a good question. Uh, do you have your own personal space when you're on the space station? And they do have their own little space. It's quite small. It's about uh, maybe a three by three and about eight feet tall. And that's your own little uh, cubicle, your own little home. Uh, that's where you sleep, you have your own personal items, that kind of stuff, and that's what you get. And as you work through well, though, it's, uh, it's all you really need. Do you ever get sick in space? Uh, luckily, I did. However, it does happen. Uh, one of the things when you go to space is that floating is uh, unusual on your body. First, your inner ear gets a little confused about how's it all going. And then uh, in your stomach, kind of, uh, you get a little queasy. Uh, if you feel it like uh, you've been on a roller coaster, when you go down the steep part of the roller coaster, you actually almost get a little bit of a free fall. Like, kind of like you feel like you're coming out of the seat a little bit. And if you've ever done that, well, that's actually the same kind of thing, but not ours, it's permanent. And so uh, you just get that. It takes a while for your body gets used to it, a day or two or so. And then after that, though, it feels great. And then you have to readjust. Of course, when you come back, you have to go through the whole process to get back and then readjust. But it's okay. Well, the total number of their in space, yeah. I think it's around 300 and something. I don't know really, I don't know off the top of my head. That's, I think it's around. Okay. Right. Oh, time, yeah, that's a good question. What time zone are we on? Yeah, because we go around all of them. Uh, yeah, so this is, a, again, it ends up being a more difficult question. When you're on the space shuttle, your sleep cycle, what we consider, you know, when you wake up and when you go to sleep, is based off your lunch time. And your lunch time is based off when the station's orbit goes over Cape Canaveral on the day you launch. And so it could be any time of day. It could be, you know, 2 in the morning, uh, 5 in the afternoon, whatever. And that, though, when you launch, that's defined about as about 5.30 p.m. in your day. You're going to go to bed about, well, five and a half to six hours after that. 
and that's going to start, that's why it works your cycle. And so uh, it can be any kind of time zone. Now when the station though is by itself, no shuttle there, it's uh, on uh, GMT time, which is Grand Street time, which is kind of like what England is on. And that's uh, what time zone they use. Wait a minute. That's a good question. Okay, when you, how long does it feel like when you come back? First, you do feel very heavy. Uh, when first, you first time you try to stand up, it feels like you're lifting a couple hundred pounds. Uh, but you slowly adapt back to that. I mean, you know, within an hour, you're feeling pretty good. And that's when we walked out, that you saw us walking. That was about an hour after we landed. And we're feeling okay. You, you walk wobbly. Uh, you can spin your head up if you move your head too quickly. Uh, and, uh, but you just don't do that. And uh, by, but of course, by a couple hours after that, of course we had to do medical experiments, and then we got to go uh, and uh, have dinner yeah, with our families, and we were fine. We mostly at that, you are probably back almost 90% by that time. And then the next morning I went for a run. It was a very slow run, but I still like I got to run it. Yeah. Yes. Oh, have you seen the Great Wall of China from space? That's a good question. It's one of those also uh, myths. Um, the reason you probably can't see the Great Wall of China is because it's the same color as the background. What you really see from space is the different colors. So you can sometimes see roads. You can see definitely like the farmland and all this, all this um, and cities uh, in the sense of it, it's because the color structure is different. So that's what you really see. You see difference in colors and lines. Uh, but you can't see the Great Wall of China because it's uh, all the same color as the background and it's not a straight line. Uh, but you can see definitely other things uh, easily from uh, the space that we have made. Uh, so can you get a connection on your cell phone? No? <laughs> Maybe if you have a satellite phone, you probably should go a little too fast to, to pick it up. And, uh, but uh, we do have the ability to, uh, through a line from our station or shuttle to uh, Mission Control, to then uh, get you know, the internet going. Not really the internet, I should say. We do have email. Uh, you can do email, and when we're on the space station, you can make uh, phone calls, kind of like voice over internet protocol phone calls to people. Of course, there's a little bit of delay and that kind of stuff, but it still works pretty well. Have you ever got, no, luckily I haven't uh, gotten stuck floating space where there's nothing to grab onto. Uh, we did go uh, through to a smaller gentleman on uh, a mission where uh, it was a big volume and they put him in the middle on purpose and just to let him see how long it takes him to get to the side. It was pretty funny, there's a video of that somewhere. But uh, yeah, you can just do all, you can swim. I mean, swimming doesn't really work much in there. Yes, sir. Yes, but everybody who lives on the space station is an amateur radio operator, and they do make calls quite a bit. Yeah, sure, what's your question? How does it take off the space shuttle? Very loudly. Um, so it uses big, big engines, and it goes straight up like that in the air. Once we get out of the atmosphere, then we'll bend over and start going sideways to get going very, very fast. But it uses big engines. It has two solid rocket boosters, which are very big, and then three engines of its own. Yes. Ooh, how do you go to the bathroom question? <laughs> yeah, I knew who's coming. It's very difficult. Right, yeah, there's everything about living in space and float is great, except for one thing. And that's it. Uh, uh, so that, not an easy thing. The, the uh, bathroom looks very similar as you would have here. But you have to, uh, the thing it does have different is it has to have these little levers that can hold you down. You need to be held down. You wouldn't want to float right during the process. That thing. <laughs> and you uh, must also use gloves. I'm going to just put it that way because it is getting messy. And, uh, and so it's a bit long and not a good process, but it, it has to be done. <laughs> Where do I like 
better be in space, or what is the second part? Skiing. Oh, oh, ski in the snow. Oh, that's a tough one. Yeah. I have to think I'm right now that I'm going with space. I do like skiing in the snow tremendously, though, but uh, space wins out just about a little bit. Hey, Steve. Yes, I did get taller in space. How much? And about an inch and a half. Yeah, your spine actually is straightened or expands while you're because there's no gravity to hold it down. And uh, you get taller. It was actually a nice thing. Of course, you really don't notice it because you're floating around anyway. Yeah. And it takes, yeah, within within probably three hours back, I remember it's all back, so it doesn't really matter. Yes. How fast can this picture go? Pretty much 17,500 miles an hour, which is five miles a second. Yeah, it's pretty fast. Yes. How cold is space? That's another good question. It takes a little bit more of explaining that than just giving you a temperature, because in a vacuum, there really isn't much of a temperature. Uh, but if you touch the metals that are out in space, like uh, when we're outside, when it's light out, they're about 250 degrees Fahrenheit, and when it's dark out, they're about minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a big range. It's going to get very cold, very hot out there. Yes. Okay, let's try. Come on. Oh, anticipation? Ah. Uh, yeah. It was pretty much a wild moment, yeah, it was. Um, again, though, what you're working on is you're getting, you know, we're going through our checklist, making sure we hit the right switches and all that as we go. And then uh, we really don't realize we're going to about nine minutes before the liftoff is when they give you that everything is good to go and then we start counting the last countdown. And again, we're going through the checklist more at that point. And then we really finish our checklist about two minutes to go. And that's the first time you really get to realize that, hey, I'm, I'm going and there's no getting off this thing right now. You can't say, hey, stop, I want to get off. That doesn't work. Uh, so I guess that's the first moment you really realize you're going. And uh, but again, you just kind of go, that's fun. So uh, you sit back and enjoy the ride. It is a tremendous ride. Have I ever seen a meteor shower where I'm on space? No, in space. And actually, that'd be really bad because it means it's going right by you. Because all those just little particles flying through the space, coming into Earth. And if you see one, it's probably meaning they're coming near your ship, and that's not a good thing. Uh, when you're going up and down in space, how does it feel to have like, uh, all the kinds of power uh, going on your space? Okay, geez. Um, it's only three Gs which isn't tremendous. However, it's a little different than an airplane. The airplane, the, the fire pods, when they pull G's, it's actually through their head coming this way. Uh, when you're on the space shuttle, you're actually leaning on your back and so the G's come through your chest. And so it feels like somebody very, very heavy is sitting on your chest as you're going through. Uh, it's only eight and a half minutes. It doesn't last that long. And, uh, it, you know, it's definitely well worth the ride. How about one more? Oh, you got a cup of gas that one. You got to go with that. Has it passed 30 degrees Fahrenheit in space? Yes, it has. Yep. <laughs> Did anything freeze in space? Yeah, if you leave something outside at nighttime in space, it will freeze. Definitely. All right. Thank you very much.